I believe that Jesus Christ is the most exciting, fascinating, awesome individual anyone could ever meet. If Jesus Christ was not real and he was not powerful, I would not be here on many levels. One, I wouldn't be here for the simple fact that uh, that 30 some odd years ago when I gave my life to Christ, I was like on this precipice. And, and what I mean by that is I was on the brink of something. I was either on the brink of a miracle or the brink of disaster. And what it was is that on my college campus, uh, I seriously was going to take my life. Now, I know, I know, I know. They say of millennials, now Gen Z, they say probably 90% of us. But it's really unfair because it's probably true of every generation. You have the thought, but nobody would follow through on it. Few people would follow through on it. I was going to do it. I was born inner city Oakland. Come on, future home in the Wakanda Outreach Center. Come on, somebody. And uh, I, uh, I, I lost my dad. Uh, my dad was shot by policemen, and they proved it was racially motivated when I was nine years of age. By the time I was your age, I was already so jacked up. Uh, man, I, 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 I can't even begin to get into it. Because of that, there were some awards and monies for me to go to a college I gave my life to Jesus Christ. That night when I cried out, Jesus showed up in the room. I'm not exaggerating. I, I mean, yeah, his presence was there, but I see Jesus like I see you. And as a result of that, here's where I stand 30 some odd years later. And I'm here to tell you that to meet Jesus is, is so awesome that, that uh, you can't even begin to put in the words what happens when Jesus Christ takes the throne seat of your heart. And life is so changed for me uh, man, but this thing of encounter, I want to invite my son to come up. My son, Brandon, uh, I've got two children. I've got a son. He's married, lives down in Los Angeles. I live up in the Bay, Northern California. Uh, ever since he was a youngster, man, he has had a set-apart life, and uh, he uh, played college basketball for Cal. In fact, we came out, and they were in the Coach versus Cancer Classic. He played in Madison Square Garden in college. He went and played pro ball overseas, but now he's a youth pastor, but... Uh, he's, he's lit, and uh, I'm telling you what, he's got it. Come on, Brandon. Come on, give your hands together, my son, Brandon. Yeah, like he said, I'm lit. <laughs> At Merge Conference, how you guys doing tonight? I'm excited. Are you guys excited? Good. I want to I wanna share just a quick encouragement to you tonight. Um, like my dad was saying, I am the product of an encounter I had with God when I was in my youth. Um, during that time, I didn't have very good friends, was surrounding myself with not very good influences in my life, and a lot of my friends started getting on drugs, and they were experimenting with things, and as a young guy, I'm watching this happen, and coming up in a Christian home, I'm feeling so conflicted, and I'm feeling convicted, because I'm seeing how radical these guys are about this and that, and I'm seeing how quiet and passive I am with my Christianity, you know, and it's that weird feeling of like, man, I should be saying something, I should be light. But I'm just here in the darkness, and I'm not doing anything to change anything, right? And so what happens is I got to this point where I decided I, I'm not going to halfway this thing anymore. You know, like too many of us leave our Christianity on this teeter-totter. Like, I'm not all the way in, but I'm kind of in. You know, I, I'm, I'm playing this, this balancing game. So I'm in a service, and I prayed one of the most honest prayers I've ever prayed in my entire life. And let me tell you, young people, your prayers don't have to be long, but let me tell you, he answers the ones that are honest. I'm in this service. I'm on the left side, third pew back. And I said, Jesus, if I can't be as radical for you as my friends are to their drugs, I don't want to serve you anymore. And immediately the Holy Spirit came on me like a fire. And God encountered me that night. And where I'm at in my life today, I truly believe is because of that encounter I had when I was a youth. And every time that we get to do this, I get the chance to travel and speak by myself, and it's amazing. And everywhere I go across this country, my hope that we bring to youth conferences, youth events, young adults, is that you, we bring to you an encounter with Jesus. Because let me tell you, information you forget. Like most of y'all probably forget what your teachers were talking about last week. We can hear scriptures, we can hear stories, we can hear all these things, and we forget it. But let me tell you, you never forget the encounters that you have with God. The encounter, all of a sudden, it just, it rocks you. And there's some of you here tonight, you've come hungry, right? Who's hungry tonight? Yeah. 
One of my favorite passages of scripture is in Luke 19. It's the story of this guy who's heard all these amazing things about what Jesus was doing. His name is Zacchaeus. And he hears that Jesus is in town. I said hers. He hears. I'm, what am I saying? He hears that Jesus is in town. He's a short dude. Any short dudes in the house? No, don't raise your hand. I'm kidding. He climbs up in a tree. Jesus, he's walking down this path, and he sees Zacchaeus in the tree. And I think what Jesus saw in that time was he saw the hunger that Zacchaeus was carrying. Zacchaeus, he wanted to see Jesus. A lot of you tonight, you're like, Jesus, I want you to become that much more real to me. I want to encounter your love. Let me tell you, he sees you. He sees that hunger, and he said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to eat dinner with you tonight, man. We're going to the Olive Garden, you know, meals on you. Zacchaeus, he has this encounter with Jesus, and everything changes for him. But let me tell you, some of us might not come hungry for being really honest with ourselves, right? Some of you are just like here because your parents signed you up. Some of you are here because your friend was like, it's going to be lit. Let's go, you know? And you decide to come. Some of you don't even know why you're here. You're kind of like, what, where is this place? Where am I? There's this passage just a couple chapters later. This is after Jesus has died, Luke 24. And there's these two guys, these two disciples. They're on the road to this place called Emmaus. It's a beautiful story. And what happens is these guys are dealing with loss. They're super saddened by the loss of Jesus, actually dying on the cross. They thought Jesus was going to come and save them in a much different way. Rather than laying his life down, they thought he was going to do a takeover, you know, pull the S off his chest, and he's like, I'm Jesus. I'm here. I'm taking over. That's not the way Jesus did it. And so these guys, they're in this dark place in their lives. They have a ton of questions, a ton of doubt. They're in despair. They're in this dark place. And without them even realizing, this other man appears and he begins walking with them down this road. But not to their knowledge yet, but it's actually Jesus. And I'm here to tell you that you might not have come hungry tonight. You might feel like you're in despair right now. You might be dealing with loss. You might be in a dark place in your life. But let me tell you, Jesus can still encounter you in that place. Man, he encounters these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and what happens at the result of this encounter, it says that their hearts begin to burn within them, and they go back to Jerusalem to go and give a testimony of Jesus coming in their lives. So let me tell you, you're hungry, an encounter can change everything for you. You're in a dark place, an encounter with Jesus can now turn you to where your heart is on fire. Your, your heart right now be, might be filled with sadness. You might be experiencing loss. I don't know what it is going on in your life, but an encounter can change everything. I am the product. One moment can change everything for you, young people. I'm serious. Let me pray for you real quick. Jesus, I just thank you that you're here. Your presence is tangible. Father, we don't have to invite you because you're already here. And Holy Spirit, I just thank you for what you have in store for these young people. I'm praying for those who are hungry tonight. I'm praying for those who aren't hungry tonight. Father, those who want you, and Father, those who have doubts about you. Father, those who are so sure and just want to continue to go deeper in their faith. And Father, even those, Father, who even, God, don't have any faith. I pray, God, tonight encounters for them. God, because I know one encounter with you can truly change everything. It could take us from a dark place to a heart being filled with love. Father, it could take us from struggling to walking in complete freedom. And so tonight, I am praying God encounters for these young people in the same way that you encountered me in my youth. I pray, God, that you'd experience, God, these youth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before I go, I want to, um, I'm, I'm selling some shirts. And this is not today, Satan. Because <laughs> I was having one of those weeks <laughs> Anyone have some of those weeks sometimes, you know, where it just seems like everything that can go wrong goes wrong? During this one week, this was a month ago, actually, it was one of those weeks where my car was breaking down, one of my high school friends had just died, um, bills were coming that I didn't even know we owed money to, and it was just one of those really stressful, stressful weeks. And finally, I sit down on the couch, and I just, I said something, I said, mm-mm, not today, Satan. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> and it just became this mentality for me that I was like, you know, you know what? I'm the wrong one to mess with. Because when Satan tries to come after me, I'm just going to go after Jesus harder. 
right? Things start going wrong in my life, I'm gonna start loving harder. And so it's just this mentality, it's just not today, Satan, in all caps. Like, I'm not playing games. You gotta put Satan in his place, amen, somebody? So we sold out of most of these shirts last week, and so there is a few left. So if you are thinking about getting this, I'd advise right after service, hop back out, grab this. All right, love you guys. Awesome, awesome. Love him. Hey, some years ago, I was preaching down in a place uh, in, called Monterey, California. And I was in this place called Monterey. I'd preach two Sunday morning services. And uh, right after that, the pastor and his wife, they took me to this place to eat. When I went to this place to eat, Monterey, California is, uh, is a very unique place. I, I joke, but I'm serious. God was in a good mood when he made Monterey, California. It's just beautiful. It's beach. It's just awesome. So I'm walking down uh, this road. As I'm walking down this path, we were going back to our car because we ate at a restaurant, but you, uh, the restaurant didn't have a parking lot, so you had to park like, like two blocks away because it was kind of like park along the street, but all the, the places were taken. It's Sunday. Everybody wants to go get something to eat on Sunday. And so we're walking as we're walking. I got the pastor. I got his wife. They're taking me back to the hotel. I preach two Sunday morning services. They're going to take me to the hotel, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to preach that night. So in Monterey, California. So I'm walking down the way. As I'm walking down the way, I'm looking up at the shops, right? First shop was Coach. You guys are familiar with Coach, right? Coach apparel, Coach purses. And so I, I was looking in the mirror, and uh, uh, as I was looking in the mirror, they had uh, a coach clutch, I think that's what you call it, and a coach-like little place to put your credit cards. It was for, for ladies. And it was advertising that you could eat this little clutch, so literally it's probably this big, right, in your hand, and a little thing that you could put some credit cards in, and they were lumping them together, and the deal was for $800 for both of them. And see, my grandma's from Dumas, Arkansas. My grandma's old school. If you want to know my grandma, my grandma's Medea off Diary of a Mad Black Woman. That's my grandmother. My grandmother... You know, kids today, they talk about, you know, like, you know, you don't want to reprimand your kids, you know, so they give you talks, timeouts, and toys taken away. That's one end of the spectrum of, of discipline. My grandma's over here attempting murder. My grandma's trying to take a brother out to put some sense inside of me. She was old school, and, her, like, she would look at me, and if I didn't act right from the look, the butt whooping was coming, and, and she didn't care who was watching, right? And, and, you know, little kids say, I'll call Child Protective Services. My grandma say, yeah, you got about an hour before they get here. I'm going to beat your butt for the next hour till they get here, okay? That's how my grandma, and Oprah says, don't whoop your kids. My grandma whoop Oprah, okay? So that's, that's putting it. So anyway, I could hear, even though she's going to be with the Lord, I could hear my grandma tell me, if you pay $800 and all you get is a clutch and a little thing to put a couple credit cards in, you need to be coached, okay? Because you stupid, you a fool. You know, she didn't put the L on the end of fool. It was just fool. You a fool. And so I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm looking like, wow, that's, that's kind of expensive, man, especially on my budget. Okay. So I'm walking. The next door was guests. All of these is boutiques, right? So they had guests, the designer guests. They had these jeans that had more holes than they had denim, right? And they was on sale. They don't even tell you who designed it. They just put a question mark on your butt, and you're going to pay multiple hundred dollars for holes, you know, and so I, I, I'm telling you this to tell you, I was just thinking, man, people in Monterey, dude, they just have a different income than where I'm from, right, especially at that time, so I'm walking, I'm not paying attention to the store, I'm talking to the pastor, I walk past this next store, when I walk past this next store, the best way I can tell you is this, all of a sudden, I feel as if someone took a two by four out, hits me across my chest, I feel like, man, I'm, I'm, having difficulty catching my breath, I get what I call a witchcraft headache to the, like, <laughs> I and mean, it was over the top witchcraft. It was extra, y'all. Come on, somebody. I mean, it was over the top, extra headache. And I'm like, I normally get this when I'm around people operating in witchcraft or Satanism. Over the years, I've witnessed to Satanists, witnessed to people in witchcraft. I've gotten a chance to lead people to the Lord. I've had some blow me off but I've never been intimidated because I know greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. This is a true story. In college, I'm, I'm going to segue for a quick minute and I'll jump back, right? In college, I witnessed to a Satanist. I went in his room and locked the door. People say, Sean, was you afraid? 
No, I wasn't afraid, but he should be afraid because I locked the door so he wouldn't get out till I cast the devil out of him. True story. This is what I did in college as a baby Christian. Wasn't even a year old in the Lord, but I understood this passage. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. How many of you understand that scripture? Good, good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is a great group, great group. All right, so I'm walking, and again, I'm not paying attention to the store. Remember, we're on a street in Monterey, and all of a sudden, I feel this demonic force field come out. And I go, oh my God, I, it was so strong, I fully expected to look down on the ground and, and like see a pentagram, and like I stood right in the middle of a pentagram or something. And all of a sudden, I look up at the store, and I, I see the sign on the store, and it was basically, it was a New Age bookstore. And I go, yeah, okay, you know, but I, I shouldn't be getting cold red demonic alert over a New Age bookstore. There's enough New Age books in secular bookstores to constitute. So that shouldn't have been what set this off. And so I'm, I'm just kind of curious. And so I keep walking. When I keep walking, what happened was it, it was a shop. They had an anti-glare kind of like tent on the window. So I, when I was in front of it, I couldn't see what was going on. When I stepped a little bit at an angle, I could see literally as close as I am to this young lady, I was that close, hey, hey, I was that close to a tarot card reader lady who is actively in a seance uh, communing with devils trying to read people's fortune. And so I saw this, and so I'm like, oh, my God, what's going on? I got to do something. So I stretched my hand out. I said, Lord, I just bind that devil in the name of Jesus. I ask you to cast it. See, notice how a brother's neck is going. That's how you get your attitude in your, you know, your, your prayer. And I kept walking. But... That wasn't what God wanted me to do. This is called a drive-by intercessory move, but God didn't want me to do a drive-by. He, he wanted me on site. So I keep walking. I get to the pastor's car, and all of a sudden, I get this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. This sick feeling is this. Many times, you know when you have an assignment from the Lord because sometimes your heart pulls you in, that you feel a burden. You feel it's kind of Christianese, which another way of saying you begin to feel God's heart of compassion that draws you, and other times you feel it because it provokes you, it ticks you off, it gets you angry. When Moses saw the oppression of the children of Israel, it ticked him off. He rose up and struck a dude. That wasn't advisable, but it demonstrated, right, that he had an assignment. Okay, now watch this. We get two blocks away, I get a sick feeling and pit on my stomach, and the Holy Spirit's dealing with me like, Sean, you weren't supposed to do a drive-by intercessory move. You got an assignment. And I begin to realize, if I don't go back, I got to preach tonight. I better honor Holy Spirit because I want him to show up with me when I come to that service tonight. So I told the pastor, I said, hey, pastor, can you turn the car around? I need to go back to that psychic parlor because I commented on it. I need to go back to that New Age bookstore where that lady was at, that, that, that tarot card reader lady. And he's kind of at first starting to look at me almost like this is an inconvenience a little bit, kind of like, hey, I want to just drop you off at a hotel, get back home. But uh, his wife was Latina. Come on, somebody. She said, baby, you need to turn this car around. Brother Sean got an assignment, man. And I was like, yeah, when the wife get on your side, you know you're going to win, man. Appreciate that Latin fire. So we turned the car around. They dropped me off, and I said, hey, uh, if you would, pray for me. I, again, I don't know how this thing's going to turn out. Like, like, what would you do, right? So I go in this New Age bookstore, and sure enough, the moment I'm in there, I could feel this, like, demonic dimension. Like, like back in the day, we called it heebie-jeebies. I'm feeling heebie-jeebies. I'm, I'm like... What you, what them folks probably, I don't watch them, but what them folks feel like in them horror movies, when the horror music, music, horror movie music starts rising, I could feel that, like, oh man, something's going to jump out. And I see there's the lady, right? She's reading these cards in the seance or whatever she's doing. She's got people lined up. And so I say, hey, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You know, I, I don't want to cut, but I did want to cut because I need to, I need to, you know, at that point in time, here's what I'm thinking. I need to rebuke you and get out. That's what I'm thinking, okay? So God was going to clear up my, my, uh, my witness, okay? But I need to rebuke you and get out. And she says, excuse me. Uh, I said, excuse me, can I, uh, can I have a word with you? She said, oh, hold on. She says, I'll squeeze you in. Give me 10 minutes. I'm going to finish this lady, but I'll squeeze you in. And I think she looked at me, and I looked different than her clientele. They all had coach bags and holy guest jeans. And so they had been shopping, and she looked at me and like, okay, you're not from around here. And so she was going to work her brother in. So 
I, I, I'm waiting 10 minutes, and I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? I walked over by this bargain table of on-sale witchcraft books, right? Now, there's a reason why I'm telling you this story, and I, I want to drop it early, drop it often, all right? The reality is, is that in your day, you are inheriting a world where the devil is reaching to the highest shelf of his power. It's called divination. That's demonic power. That's witchcraft. That's psychic stuff. That's all that. There's a reason why we are so supernatural. It like, always amazes me when churches kind of try to de-supernaturalize their service because they want to meet the first-time visitor where they're at. And I'm just saying, you, you, by doing that, have in all sense ensured you will not meet them where they're at because have you are you aware of what's going on you cannot have right anything without the supernatural you get up on Saturday morning you got supernatural cartoons little kids playing supernatural video games come on there's supernatural there's a show called supernatural come on Lucifer got a show Legion got a show Jesus needs to have a show hello somebody you go to a movie the trailers are all supernatural the interests in terms of where we're investing our money in terms of psychics and new age and people and astrology and the popularity of it has risen amongst the emerging generation like few things they can imagine. And then we're going to have church where we're going to bind and gag the Holy Ghost and help them to a back room because we don't want the Holy Spirit to offend and blow the people away. Like, hello, come on somebody. You <laughs> All the while, you're trying to have to bring entertainment because entertainment and human eloquence has taken the place of Holy Ghost power. And if the Holy Spirit was there, the place would get turned quick. And other than that, you're left to try to keep them entertained, keep them coddled, keep them. And tell you what, in youth, you had better have supernatural powers. Here's where I'm getting towards. In your generation, the devil's reaching at the highest shelf, divination. God's highest shelf is a higher shelf, and now, thus I'll finish this encounter I had. And there's another D word. It's called dunamis. In Acts 1.8, right? It says, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power. Come on, somebody say, I got the power. Come on, say it with me. Oh, come on, one more time. Dunamis is the Greek biblical word for power there. It means dynamite explosive miracle working power like dunamis dun, dunamis is come on now the six infinity stones or five however many stones five infinity six stone hey when you get dunamis on you you have a level of authority man okay now now I, some of y'all convinced some of y'all not that's my job tonight i gotta convince you okay here we go so i'm in this place i'm over this bargain table i'm in the new age bookstore as i'm looking at it i see a book called the Idiot's Guide to Tarot Card Reading. And here's what I say. Yeah, you got that right. You got to be an idiot to believe in this stuff. You know, that, that's where I was at. But it was funny in that moment. <laughs> you ever make yourself laugh? I made myself laugh when I thought that. I like laughed out loud. Again, I'm in a New Age bookstore. I didn't have this precious group behind me. I didn't have a precious brother on the keys. Nothing like that. How many of you know Holy Ghost could show up out there? At whether it's your high school campus, your JC, your college, your workplace, amongst sports teams, whatever activities you're on, right? Because he's going to go where you go. Some of y'all need to take him some places. Hello, Holy Spirit, I just felt that. That's for somebody. Holy Spirit said, you need to take me with you sometime. Don't leave him back at youth group. Don't leave him back at emerge. The word emerge means he's trying to step out. Come on. So he steps in your life in encounter so he can step out and emerge and bring the kingdom where you go. All right? I understand. That's what propaganda talked about last night. Kingdom. Awesome. So here I am, and all of a sudden I get this. <laughs> Here's what I immediately knew. I immediately knew that I was supposed to walk over to this new age lady and say, I am your sign. Number two, I immediately knew she had a bad experience when she was a kid with religion. She ended up moving in with the Eastern guru. That means kind of like a dude who would train her in witchcraft stuff. He, she moved in with the Eastern guru she thought was going to nurture her, but he ended up abusing her. And the Lord showed this to me. And number three, ever since she was a little girl, she had a dream. What she's doing now is not her dream. She's doing this by default. This is not her design. Tell her if she'll let go of this, tarot card reading, I'll let her grab onto that, which is her dream. 
this all came in like a nanosecond. It's called when God reveals his mind. It's called the prophetic. All of a sudden, I'm over a New Age bookstore, and again, I was going to walk over to her like Paul in Acts chapter, I think it's Acts chapter, uh, what is it, Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 16, somewhere around there. I think it's Acts 16. That he rebukes the girl with a spirit of divination, commands her to come out, and Apostle Paul, man, dropped the Psychic and Friends hotline off the air with one sentence, okay? But I, I wasn't supposed to rebuke her. Once God showed me that she had been abused, it was like my heart turned towards her. And I believe there's such a power in this dimension of the supernatural when you can move in God's heart space for the person in front of you. When you can truly love people, you can become prophetic at a whole nother level. So all of a sudden, the lady motions for me to come over, and I'm coming over, but I got something. So I start off like this. She says, uh, hey, uh, would you like a reading? And I, I said, no, I don't want to read. I just like to have a word with you. And she immediately started like, you know how you do cards when you're playing Uno or you're playing any of these card games? She whips out a card. True story. First card she whips out on me is a devil card. What's the odds? Like, there's only, my understanding, two devil cards in a tarot card pack. What's the odds that the first card she whip out on her brother is a devil card? Hmm. All right. Okay. All right. It's like, it's going to be like that, right? The devil always wants to get in the way of you emerging. But let me tell you something, and we're going to hit this again. Revival. I believe the greatest number of people, young people, that are going to give their life to Christ are going to do it on your watch. I believe that a new Jesus people movement is about to hit the earth. I believe the young people are going to become the voice of awakening. You have a justice thing on you as a generation. But when you get Holy Ghost and justice on you and kingdom on you, you walk in such a way the devil's got to back up, back out, or back away because what's on you is greater than what the devil can throw at you. So I walk up to this lady, and she, she like, didn't hear me. I said, no, no, I don't want to read him. She's trying to get me read. I said, no, 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 no. Can I just ask you a question then? Because I believe if I will offer listening up front, when it comes time for me to talk, she'll offer listening back. Sometimes you're witnessing, we don't do that. We're just so busy trying to tell them what we know, we don't listen to them. So I said, can I ask you a question? How do those cards get you in touch with the spirit realm? She says, well, I have this chi. There's this eternal consciousness, and I can project my chi into the archetype of the cards. And the sequence of the archetype of the cards can accurately predict one's future. And I'm thinking, people pay her money for that? That's fortune cookie level stuff right there. That's, that's boo-boo. I mean, come on now. So she shares that with me. And so I said, hey, can I tell you how I get in touch with the spirit realm? And she says, yes. So I said, it might as well be two doors. Because if you go through any other door other than the door I'm going to share with you, it looks good up front. But once you walk through that door, that door closes in on you. And it locks you in. And it doesn't become opportunity. It becomes a prison. Ignorance. Some people say ignorance is bliss. No, ignorance is the worst penitentiary anyone could ever live in. People say what you don't know won't hurt you. Whoever said that is dead, okay? Because what you don't know can kill you, okay, somebody? Can I get some help over here? Isn't that true? Isn't that true? So, I said, any other door you go through is going to close on you, but there's the door where I tap in the spirit around. The door is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I begin to share, she backs up. So here's what I'm saying to you. If all I had was your basic, you know, kind of, you know, Christianese, you need Jesus, hell is hot, heaven's good, give your life to Christ so you don't go to hell, get to heaven, my moment's over. Old school pinball machine, tilt, game over, you know, modern, you know, whatever it is, Sony PlayStation 4, you know, the, the, the extra man died, whatever it is. But how many of you know God spoke to me? I said, hey, you know what? And she's leaning back and she's about to sh shut it all down. I said, oh, by the way, the Jesus I'm telling you about, he just spoke to me about you. Can I tell you what he told me? She says, what did he say? You know, she's all spooky and everything. And I said, number one, the Lord wanted me to tell you I am your sign. Now, let me, let me back up for a second. People have asked me, Sean, how did you know it was God? Sometimes you got to know yourself and how you speak to yourself, and that'll help you discern how God speaks. Now, ultimately, read the Bible, spend time with Holy Spirit, That'll help you discern. 
But sometimes his voice and your thoughts sound alike. But if you know how you think, I don't walk up to unknown women and go, I am your sign, girl. You know, I, I just, not my MO, that's never. So I'm, I'm thinking when this came to me, I think this might be God. I'm not going to walk up to a woman and go, I am your sign, okay? I walk up to her and I say, I'm your sign. I'm not exaggerating. She initially is facing me. She turns her head sides, sideways. I can see that her eyes are watering up. I can tell she's fighting tears. So I'm like, okay, good, it's connected. I said, number two. Jesus told me that when you were a young girl, you had a bad experience with religion. You end up moving in with an Eastern guru that you thought was going to nurture you, but instead of nurturing, he abused you. She starts outwardly crying. No exaggeration. I mean crying. And there's all these women with coach bags and guest jeans in, in line watching this. Okay, so they're seeing this. I said, number three, the Lord told me that what you're doing now, reading to roll cards, that was not your dream as a young girl. You're doing this by default. But God says if you'll let go of tarot card reading. He'll let you grab on to your dream because all along that was God's design for you. I'm not exaggerating. Here's what the woman says to me. She turns to me fully like losing her makeup, like right, right? Because she didn't come there expecting to cry. She goes, how did you know? Check, miss. You project the collective consciousness of your chi into the accurate archetype of the cards and it can predict your future. Miss, that is asking me, and I said, Jesus. So here's what she tells me. She says, last night, I cried out to the cosmos, and I said, cosmos, tomorrow give me a sign. I walked past a, you, <laughs> you don't think that the steps of the righteous have been mapped out by Holy Ghost in advance. I'm walking past a store because we didn't have a parking spot and I was initially thinking, man, it's a long way, Pastor. We had to walk two blocks. This fool better be good. And then we walked back this way, happened to walk right past Why she wasn't taking, she could have been taking a break or something, right? She's on in the midst of it. I feel this demonic interference, but I'm still walking, right? I'm doing a drive-by intercessory move blessing. I get to a car. I'm this close from just letting it go, and the Holy Spirit turns it around. And sometimes small acts of obedience can move history. Sometimes you don't recognize how powerful your yes can be in a moment that seems overwhelming and daunting. So let me tell you the rest of the story. She says, last night, I was asking for a sign. So here I am, two blocks away, er, turn around. I walk up to her and it says, Oh, by the way, how do you get in touch with the spirit realm? My touch, my way of getting in touch, Jesus. And Jesus said to me, I am your sign. And she's connecting us to me. I, I didn't know what I am your sign meant, right? It's connecting with her. Sometimes you know in part, prophesy in part, but you do your part, God to do his part. And then all of a sudden the puzzle comes together. <laughs> then she says, when I was a little girl, she went to a parochial school. It was a religious school. Uh, and she said she had a bad experience. So she ended up moving in with this warlock kind of Eastern teacher dude. He kind of taught her the mystic arts. He says, but she, he ended up abusing her sexually, physically, and mentally. She's telling me this. She's opening up now. Like, I'm told stranger, walk out, out off the street, but because I have inside information, she's sharing her story. And she's number three. Ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to paint, not like houses, but pictures, artists. I always wanted to paint, never thought I could pay the bills painting, so I got into road car, because that's the only thing I got out of the relationship able to do to make myself marketable, and so here I am. And so here she is. I could tell she's wrecked, right? I mean, she's, she's wrecked. And so I said, hey, the same Jesus that shared that with me, he loves you. He's pursuing you. And that's the reason why we're having this moment right now. I said, that Jesus wants a hold of your life. Would you give your life to Christ? She says, yes. She's actually nodding her head, tears in her eyes, yes, right? We grab hands on this black tablecloth on a, in a New Age bookstore in Monterey, California, which is New Age City area, Monterey, Carmel, California. You've been there. It's a lot of New Age stuff. They uh, literally do animal sacrifices up in the mountain in Santa Cruz and that whole area, right? I mean, I used to work at a Bible school there, and we would always hear stories, police reports of stuff going up in the mountains. She grabs my hand. I lead her in a prayer. She gives her life to the Lord. She renounces witchcraft repents of it, gets up, walks over to the cash register, asks for her last check, because they were doing it like by contract, you know, like she wasn't like a quote-unquote employee of the store. They just brought her in, you know, on days to drum up business. 
She quits, asks for her last paycheck, walks out the store when we walk out the store, and all of a sudden when this happened, even as even now, I'm kind of shaking myself like, did this just really happen? You ever have God do something that kind of just blows you away a little bit? I walked past her table, and when I walked past the table, there was her tarot card deck plus the devil card that she had turned up. I just thought, I'm about to turn this devil card over. I walked by, true story, I flipped the devil card back over just to put him in his place, let him know you're face down on this, right? Because Jesus is faced up. When Jesus' face is shining, man, everything shifts. Now I want to read to you this passage, and it's right out of Acts 13. Acts 13 and verse 6. So if you have an iPhone, go to it with me now. <laughs> Bible, whatever you got. Like Everybody's kind of on their... Right? All right, here we go. I'll read it to you. Acts 13, 6 says, Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. I love that, right? He's smart. This man, he went to Yale. That's where he probably went to. All right. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Okay, so this intelligent dude who is part of the pro-council. He's kind of a Roman-appointed like, politician, right? He kind of is curious about the things of God, so he sends for Saul and Barnabas, okay? But notice this. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, is this same dude, Bar-Jesus, withstood them. Somebody say, withstood. Oh, come on, come on. Let's try it again. Say, withstood. Withstood them, seeking to turn the pro-council away from the faith. Then Saul is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and they went around seeking someone to lead by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at teaching the Lord. Notice this. The proconsul believed the teaching when he saw. Isn't that interesting? It didn't say he believed when he heard. He believed when he saw. There was something he needed to see. And as a result of him seeing what he needed to see, he believed. It's interesting because we think people will come to Christ or people's lives will be turned around based on information. But as my son said, there's something about an encounter that brings transformation. You guys with me? Last night, my son and I, we flew into JFK, and Steve came. Come on, y'all give Steve a hand. Steve, Steve. Love you, Steve. Steve picked this up, and he's immediately drawn into this because I hadn't seen my son. My son lives in uh, Los Angeles. I hadn't seen him for a couple, actually a week, actually. We were doing an outreach last week at UCLA. And we started talking about Infinity Wars, right? The latest Marvel comic MC. Ever since I was a kid, I was into comic books, and I've kind of watched particularly starting in, what, 2008, when they did the Iron Man. At that point, you know, some of the earlier movies was kind of like cheesy, but Iron Man, they started to do right, and then there's this buildup that they let you know that first kind of deal that they're going to build up to this Infinity War. So it's all this stuff, right? So I'm watching Infinity Wars, but if you notice, Infinity Wars didn't follow the old structure of superhero movies. Like, what I'm saying in that, if I can say it, is... They didn't neatly tie up the story angle, so by the time the theater to the lights came up, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, it, it wasn't neatly packaged back together the way you wanted it to. Like when you saw, man, Black Panther, you saw them open up, the conflict or crisis is introduced, the, the protagonist, antagonist, good guy, bad guy, they fight, and all of a sudden, at the end of the day, good prevails. Man, you know, to uh, T'Challa, to, to man, he does his thing, and man, Black Panther, boom, it's awesome, right? But if you saw Infinity Wars, it left you hanging a little bit. How many of you understand that? But uh, it was terrible. Come on, somebody say, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. And I started thinking about it. It ends with the audience unsure of what's going to happen in the next installment. You're left unsure. How many of you have seen it? Okay, I just want to, oh man, okay, like, yeah, 85% of you, right? Now, at the same time as Marvel fans, you know they're going to have Ant-Man versus Wasp, right? You know they're going to have Captain Marvel, 
you know that they're, if you don't know, they're going to have another Spider-Man, and they're going to have a, Wakanda is going to be Wakanda forever. There's going to be a sequel to Wakanda. Black Panther's coming back. So how many of you know, even though you don't know how it's going to end or come together in the next picture, how many of you know it's going to come together? Now, let me hold that thought. I'm going to try to kind of back up and approach this point I'm making from another angle. I love to record DVR, right, sporting events, and I love local sports, and I, I know you guys are, are kind of in between. I don't know. Do we have any Boston Celtic fans here? Boston Celtic, come on. Uh, New York Knicks fans, y'all bold, brave folks. Come on, man. All right, bro. Uh, I love that. That's a true fan. And uh, my home team right in our area is the Golden State Warriors, right? I love, oh, come on now. That's awesome. Oh, man, y'all. Hey, Marco, I love your people, bro. I love, I love your people. So I'll record Golden State games, but this didn't happen too often this season, but it did happen. I will record a game, but if the Warriors lost, I wasn't watching it. Anybody like that, they'll record their team. Because why? I don't want to spend two hours to watch my team get beat down. I'll record it, and then if I, I'll check the, the final conclusion. Some people don't do this. They say, don't tell me the score. I don't want to know. No, I do want to know. Because I don't want to watch a game where we get beat, right? I'll record the game. You guys are with me. And when we win, I'll watch the game. Now, I'm even know watching the game, knowing the outcome. I mean, if you're with me, it changes everything. When, man, all of a sudden, they get in a place where they're throwing away the ball to call turnovers. When all of a sudden, whoever they're playing, uh, James Harden, whoever starts getting hot or whatever, other people that originally watched it not knowing the end, they're sweating, oh, no, are we going to lose? I, I'm, I'm like eating food. I'm not worried about it. Why? Because I know the outcome. I know how it's going to end. I think so often there are so many uncertainties in the world that you're inheriting it looks like sometimes the devil's winning. It looks like sometimes injustice is served with no answer from justice. It looks like sometimes that man division and all of a sudden hatred and all of a sudden, man, this depersonalization, this, this thing. It looks like drugs, gang warfare. It looks like, man, uh, family splitting up. It looks like these kind of things of violence and heartache win. But here is the thing that you got to know. You... Approach things differently when you know the outcome. Knowing that there is going to be an Ant-Man versus Wasp, there's going to be Captain Marvel, there's going to be a Spider-Man, and uh, there's going to be Black Panther. Some of y'all didn't make the movie. A couple of them people I mentioned are in the movie, and you don't know what happened to them because they look like they could be dead or they look like they come back. But if they're going to make another movie, how many of you know they're going to come back? How many of you are with me on that? If I know the Warriors are going to win the game and I'm watching... It changes everything. So, Sean, what are you saying? I believe that you're in a world where it seems like Satan is winning, but a time is coming, and I believe you're part of that, where wrongs will be made right. God is going to have the final say. Not today, Satan. I believe that you are part of this Reformation generation that's going to bring reform and reformation, and what it's going to look like is this. It's going to initially feel like God Am I ready for this moment? Okay, now let me, let me do all this in about 10 minutes, okay? Here is Saul. Saul had an encounter right on a horse. He was killing Christians. He had an encounter with God. The dude is blinded for 70. People say the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Not in Acts chapter 9 he isn't. He knocked a man off a horse and blinded him for three days. That does not sound like a cosmic butler of any sort, okay? God is... That God sounds like God with creation on his resume. I got up on, on the third day out of the tomb and death held in the grave and the keys to the devil's house is in my hands, not in his hands. That's the God that's awesome, right? So he blinds. So here's Saul. Now he's part of the early church and he's in a room. They're praying. They're seeking God. In the process of that, it says, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul. Let me tell you something about revival. Revival begins with identity. Holy Spirit calls Saul, young convert still at this point in time, calls Barnabas out by name. And in the Amplified Version, it says, set apart. Revival begins when you realize, young person, you are set apart. How many of you know, come on, let's, let's go Boston, right? Jason Tatum, two years ago, was playing high school ball someplace. 
Then he goes to Duke. Then he's drafted by Boston. Wise move, Danny Ainge. And the dude is bowling in the Eastern Conference Finals. He's amazing. But two years ago, he's in high school. How many of you know he's probably not at every party? He's probably in the gym working on his game a little bit. He's probably working on threes. He's working on being able to cross someone up. These are kind of all basketball skills that would allow him to operate at a professional level. Because if two years ago you're going against high school competition, the very next year you're going against high D1 competition, but the very next year you're slamming on LeBron James and bumping him in the chest as you run down court. How many of you know he had to live a life set apart for what he believes he was supposed to do, the, the arena and the court he's supposed to play on? So many young people, the reason why I believe that there's compromise, and we can say a lot of things and go a lot of areas with that, but here's what I submit to you. You don't know who you are. The reason why we'll let the devil defeat us and beat us down and give in to a compromise, give in to a, a lifestyle, a philosophy, or something uh, uh, that is addicting, that is uh, bondage-inducing, uh, something that hinders us, is that we don't know who we are. You know, here's the thing about revival and identity, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm still pulled from a Marvel movie, okay? Black Panther, right? Remember, he's getting beat down by Umbaku. Isn't that, that's the dude's name, right? The first dude. He's getting beat down. Is it Umbaku? Okay, he's getting beat down by Umbaku, right? He's been beat down. Angela Bassett is his mother. She's awesome. Like, you, know, hey, you want Angela Bassett to be your mother, man. She's like classy, right? She says to him, show him who you are. I mean, she didn't say it like that. She didn't. I had more testosterone in my voice than she did. You know, show them who you are. I don't know how she did, but she said something along those lines. And man, Black Panther's getting beat down because he drunk the little thing. He doesn't really have the Black Panther full powers. Actually, doesn't have any of the powers. Uh, and in that moment, he's getting beat down. But all of a sudden, you remember the quote, the phrase. It's awesome. And he says to Mbaku, who's beating him up, "I am T'Challa, son of T'Chaka." king of Wakanda. And what happens is the discovery of his identity revives his fight. And all of a sudden, he beats homeboy down. Just boom. Come on, fam. Help me with this. Beats him down. And all mama said was, tell him who you are. And in that moment, the connection with identity revives his fight. There's so many young people that are getting beat down in spiritual warfare. They're getting beat down by life. And I believe part of it is because you don't know who you are. You don't know that your life is set apart. That's why you can't do, nor should you want to do, what everyone else is doing. My son got up and said he had a close friend, tragically, even in, in, in terms of at middle school, already selling, slinging, everything else, having a gun. And lo and behold, the guy commits murder and shoots his girlfriend in his mother's house and the guy is serving a life sentence right now and this kid literally was man and still is I'm convinced a very charismatic young guy a couple years older than Brandon he was kind of a big brother to Brandon and even kind of said hey man uh, and more or less Brandon don't go the way I'm going like he he would just kind of shelter him no no Brandon didn't do that Brandon didn't smoke Brandon doesn't drink Brandon doesn't do that and kind of sheltered him and I think part of what gripped him he said he didn't know who he is. Revival is going to spark in your generation because you and I are about to back up to destiny. God's going to hold up a mirror and show you who you are in him. You're beautiful, young lady. Let me tell you what. You're beautiful. It don't matter what some young dude is trying to run them little lines and trying to be fresh and the brother's just thirsty, but he need to be thirsty for Jesus. John chapter 4, thirsty. But that brother's Facebook thirsty, Instagram thirsty, Snapchat thirsty, right? Let that brother go. Come on. I remember these young girls that say, my boyfriend tells me I need to lose weight. He says, I need to lose 99 pounds, right? And I'm like, I know you can lose 99 pounds. Dump him, okay? That's how you can lose 99 pounds of dead weight. Dump him, okay? That's, that's my word. Amen. God bless you. Dominus Omis, you are blessed, okay? Very next thing is where they go, okay? How many of you still give me... I, I'm looking at it. I got six and a half minutes. How many of you still give me six and a half minutes? Wave, wave your hand. Okay, okay. I had to know that. I had to know that. Awesome. They go to this place called Paphos. My daughter, I've got a daughter. She just recently got engaged. Brandon's 27. My daughter just turned 26 or 15 months apart. My daughter, Brittany, sixth grade, she went on her first missions trip. Let me stop rewinding. Everybody look this way. Everybody look this way. This is Saul of Tarsus, first missionary trip. 
Here's where you go on your first missionary trip. My daughter goes to Rancho de Suninos in Mexico. It's an orphanage. They, man, made balloon. They did clowns. They did puppets. Chicle, chicle, gum. They passed out gum to little kids, invited them. That's, you're safe. You know, you, you know when you open up a computer that's had a virus, you go into safe mode, right? It's safe mode. When, on your first missionary trip, this is where you usually go. Apostle Paul goes to Paphos. Somebody say Paphos. The name Paphos, the city he sent to, which is still a city today, it means boiling hot. And it was. It was a hot spot of demonic activity. It was a land that was kind of like the Bermuda Triangle horror movie place if you were a believer trying to witness and share God. So he goes to Paphos. Here's the best way I could describe it. If you could bring in the out of control, in some instances the way people would look at it, okay? Out of control, uh, uh, red light district in Amsterdam, Holland, is they're over-sexualized, any perversion. Maybe some of the United States would say, man, Bourbon Street, uh, during Mardi Gras in, in New Orleans. I've walked down that street. I've been involved in outreaches during that time. It's over-sexualized, perversion. Anything can walk up on you. Everything, just stuff you don't even want to talk about, okay? So if we could take Paphos, if we could take the out-of-control sexuality, Paphos was the home site epicenter for Venus. Like Venus, y'all heard of Venus? is like, like, Phoenician, Greek, mythological, you know, like Zeus, Achilles, Wonder Woman, Venus. Come on, y'all know what I'm saying. <laughs> Wonder Woman shouldn't be there. Okay, but it is because of the movie. Okay. Y'all ladies think of Venus. I'm Venus. I'm your, it's a little shaving thing. Shave your legs. That's how we're talking about. Venus is the goddess of sexuality. She had a shrine there that, that experts on it say that one look at this statue could deprive you in, in character and deprave you in your mind. Like she had, it was a place of a one look wreck you for life statue because it had such a demonic charge on the statue. It was demonic, right? But in addition to that, in Paphos, say Paphos, number two, I said number one is like, is like Bourbon Street during Mardi Gras or, or Red Light District in, in Amsterdam. Number two is like Las Vegas. Anything could be bought and sold. Anything was gambled on right? You could buy, sell anything you can gamble. Money was being exchanged, greed. It was all of that going on. In addition to that, there's a place you may or may not have heard of it, right? This place is a place where in Arizona, it's called Sedona, Arizona. They do the harmonic convergence. It's considered the new age or, or psychic witchcraft, you know, like hot spot in America. So let me put it together. God sends Saul of Tarsus on your first missions trip. You're not doing balloons and puppets and selling chicle. He sends you to the most demonized, sexual, anything can be bought and sold, place where they're worshiping devils, and this is your first missions trip. How many of you know, like, where are the puppets? You know, bring back the puppets, okay? No, 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 we're not having puppets. Because when God sends you someplace, all the equipping you need is in the fact he sent you. He sent you into the world. He placed you at your school. He placed you at your workplace. Everything you need to be successful, to be literally a believer coming back with a W. Because no one would think that a first-time missions trip dude should go in this and come back with a W. You'd think you'd come back with an L. No, he's about to come back with a W. So he all of a sudden gets a witness, right? If I can get someone to come to the keys. He gets a witness to the governor. I don't know the governor of Connecticut. I'm sure uh, he or she is a fine person. Years ago, <laughs> did I say Connecticut? Okay, okay. A while back, California had Arnold Schwarzenegger as our governor. It was very interesting. The Terminator, I'll be back. Actor, he's our governor. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Imagine if I got years ago to go witness to Arnold Schwarzenegger as a governor, but then he had a dude by him, and the Bible tells his name is Elimus or Bar Jesus. That should tell you right now, this dude in the Christian, okay, Bar Jesus, all right? Bar, we think of Bar like to keep something out, right? But Bar meant son of. So the dude's saying he's the son of Jesus. He's saying Jesus had you know, whatever, with Mary Magdalene, had a baby, this is me, I'm, I'm, I'm the young kid. So the dude was whack, he was off. He's already, 
this Antichrist spirit. But he's working mystic arts to try to keep. And so often witchcraft wants to link with power structures, political structures, governmental structures, education and public schools. This spirit wants to link on college campuses and universities. It wants to link in entertainment. This alignment spirit is way bigger than one character. And the Bible says that, if you will, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Roman appointed governor, proconsul, Sergius Paul is his name, asked for Saul and Barnabas. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you. Hold on. I'll tell you what I forgot to tell you in just a moment. Let me get this far. The guy asked for a witness, but the Bible says this dude, Alimus, San Francisco, the dude's dead now. But there was a guy out of San Francisco that wrote the Satanic Bible. His name is Anton LaVey. He's the founder of the first church of Satan. He's con he was considered the most uh, pronounced Satanist, right? Died. He's, he's dead. Imagine if I'm going, you're going to witness to Arnold Schwarzenegger, but Anton LaVey is there doing demonic Dr. Strange stuff. He's just blocking everything you're trying to say, and he just, all your words go into this thing, and you know, and so he's working his mystic arts, and the Bible uses this phrase. Look at me, young people. We're done, like here, like we're just, we're minutes away. It says, now Alimus withstood Saul, but right before it, it says this, now Saul, who is also called Paul, right, filled with the Holy Spirit, and it says that he resisted. Second thing, it's only a two-point message. Number one, revival begins with identity. I believe there's going to come a major, major move of God in the, in the New England area of young people. Why? Because the devil has made this the least church region in the United States of America. Wouldn't it be God to go to the least church region of the United States just like it's God to send a dude on his first missionary trip to the most impossible scenario. But why? Because God gets the glory that way. I'm not saying the Bible Belt is not going to get hit, but I'm telling you what, young people start a Jesus movement in the New England area. Hey, man, everybody's going to know that. That was God, dude. That was God. Come on, say it with me. That was God. It says Saul, also called Paul. Acts 13, everybody look at me. It's the first time he's called Apostle Paul. He had been Saul of Tarsus. And then it hit me. What was the difference that started the chapter and what ended the chapter where the guy goes from Saul to Paul? It's right there in the passage. We read it. Saul, also called Paul. Let me tell you what it is. And it's the reason why you're experiencing the warfare you're experiencing. It's the reason why you're facing the resistance you face. It's the reason why you have the struggles with identity, who I fit in. Identity, community, and destiny are the three big things of millennials. And I want to tell you why. You're having status-changing battles. Him going from Saul to Apostle Paul happened because he faced resistance. You run from your battles, you run from your promotion. A Christian that runs from a challenge in other words, you need to stand for Christ out there, but people are going to look at you funny. They're going to talk about you. You know, they're going to they're gonna whatever on you. And we back off our witness. A Christian that backs off from resistance makes as much sense as a bodybuilder that runs from weights. The reason why a bodybuilder takes on that resistance is that's where your definition and strength comes from. What defines you and what builds you up, young person, is that we don't run from battles. We run two battles. There's a little dude by the name of David ran at a battle. That was a bad day for a giant named Goliath. Goliath, you better go lieth down because I'm about to knock your butt out, okay? Okay? All of a sudden, all this demonic interference is going on. Paul's trying to witness. And for the sake of time, this is what I want to land it on. Paul recognized this dude isn't getting it because until I deal with this, there's always going to be interference. And here's what I want to say about revival. I told you there's two points, and I didn't give you the point, so I want to give you the final point that I want to give you. I said, number one, revival begins with destiny. Excuse me, with identity. Say identity. And the second thing that I want to bring out is this. Revival seldom occur without confrontation. It's usually a confrontation or resistance that sparks revival. Second Great Awakening 
Yale University, not too far from here, literally over half the student body at Yale gave your life to Christ in one move of God. You don't think God could do it again? Come on, man. It's our hope, man. It's our hope, sweetheart. It's our hope. Our hope is, hey, it may not look good now. It may look like Thanos got the upper hand. But, dude, we know where this is going to go. We're about to get a sequel. Hello, somebody. And Jesus is about to knock Thanos out, okay? <laughs> or, or the Avengers, all right? You're the Avenger generation. So here's what Apostle Paul did, and I'm done. He says, remember, now he's Apostle Paul. got his promotion because he took on the battle. You run from the battle, you run from your promotion. Christian that runs from a fight makes as much sense as a bodybuilder that runs from weights. Doesn't make sense. Apostle Paul points at this dude who is the Satanist, and he said, you son of Satan, full of all deceit and fraud. Now stop. It's the only time Apostle Paul ever called anyone son of the devil, son of Satan. And let me tell you what, there was a lot of demonic folks he dealt with, only one. This dude was probably, right, one-man horror movie right here. And he didn't argue with him. He didn't debate him. He didn't get on social media and go come against him because that's not how we fight him. This is how we fight our battles. However that song go. This is how I fight my battles. Come on. This is how I fight my, I can't sing, but y'all can jump with me. You can help a brother. Oh, 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 all right. Mm, I feel anointing of God. Something's happening right now. Something's happening, seriously. Some of you are one encounter from being a one man, one woman revivalist that lights up this area that they'll write about you. It's not enough to go pay a movie to see some fictitious actor get paid big bucks because a writer wrote a great spring screenplay and I'm entertained by it as you are. But you know why we're drawn to that? Because it appeals to the heroic, heroic dimension in you. Jesus, the reason why you're a hero because a hero lives in you, Jesus, and he's wanting to rise up in this hour. Apostle Paul speaks to the dude and the dude goes blind. Okay, so you're the governor and you're like, well, this dude over here made a good point. You know, my aide, the Satanist dude, and Apostle Paul's trying to witness and he just say, you know, kind of more than this, but hush, you're of the devil. Boom. And the dude, and by the way, Apostle Paul says, you're going to go blind. The Bible says for a season, God was good. So the dude that's the head Satanist that literally is called son of the devil the dude is needing someone to lead him around because he's totally blind. And in that moment, we read it. It says, when the proconsul saw what has happened, he then believed. Here's where we're going to end tonight. God wants to put the mantle of supernatural power on you, on your witness. We won't win a generation out there if we don't walk in the juice. If we're struggling, it's just proof we don't know who we are. And if we are not walking in revival, it's proof that we simply haven't allowed the confrontation and revival it takes to kick us into that next level of authority. You're Saul, but when you take on the demonized son of Satan, dude, you're Apostle Paul. Now that apostolic thing comes on you, that anointing, that mantle comes on you. Because the Bible says, and it's clear, the weapons of warfare are not carny, carnal, or not of the flesh, but mighty in God for the putting down of strongholds. In other words, they get mighty when they get around the stronghold. There's gifts in you that won't get activated. Let me tell you another way. Hebrews 11 says, it says, women receive back their dead, uh, uh, put foreign armies to flight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then Hebrews 11, 32, Faith Hall of Fame, man, Springfield, Massachusetts, the scripture, that's the Basketball Hall of Fame. It says, and they became mighty in battle. As if to imply, before they came to the battle, they didn't know they had might. Might is in you, but it doesn't get activated if you don't go to the battle. If you stand up, if you'll take it, if you will, man, I'm just going to stand up. I stood up first week I'm saved. I stand up on benches at my university. And, man, I'm a baby Christian. I'm hours in the Lord, 72 hours in the Lord. I stand on a park bench in the middle of my public, secular university. I share my testimony to give Christ. I didn't even ask my campus pastor permission. He comes around the corner. He sees me on it, and he's like, he tells me later, he said, oh, my God, you don't know what a dude who just got saved might say. I might fool around and cuss, okay? I'm, I'm still trying to get past the checkpoint of salvation fully. I told them how God changed my life. I told them about the power of God to reach into the deep, darkest places in your heart. I talked to them about this thing of everyone searching for the most blissful state and the most blissful state you can ever imagine is the smile of God upon the human heart. 
when you lay your head on your pillow at night, when you got the smile of God on the human heart, it's the ultimate human experience. It doesn't get better than that. And I talked to him about how, man, I wanted to kill myself, but now I want to lay my life down. And, man, all of a sudden, my campus pastor says nodding his head, so I guess I'm doing all right. He, he would carry this duffel bag because he's a, a, a quarterback from the football team before he became campus pastor. He sat down, listened. People listened. And people said, were you scared? I was before I came to Christ, but I wasn't after God encounter with Holy Spirit. Everyone bow your heads, and you guys have done so well. Bow your heads. Hmm. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Jesus, Lord, I believe you're speaking to us about two things. Number one, about identity, about knowing who we are. That's why it's so important for us to stay in the word because the world, to the world, you're a student identification number, your social security number, you're a statistic, you're a Madison Avenue merchandising dollar. They have no value for you because they can't see you for who you are. But then there's a God in heaven. And that's what makes suicide such an ultimate tragedy because your life is proof. Your existence is proof. Your life contains something your generation needs. And that's why you're here. You're here to change the world. All of creation is groaning. They're suffering, waiting for you to manifest what God's put inside. That's what the Bible says. All of creation groans in eager anticipation for the revealing of the sons of God. Sons and daughters. God, man, the world is waiting for you to activate your identity. It's time. Come on, as a Fantastic Four dude. They're going to redo that too. The flame dude. He go, flame on. It's time for you to say that. And the second thing is, I don't run from battles. I run to battles because light shines best in darkness. I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid because the one that died for me, that resurrected out of the tomb for me, goes before me, rises up big inside of me and follows me in a way that I can lock myself in a room with Satanists and know that the devil is going to be the one beat up on. And I'm walking out with a kid giving his life to Christ. I mean, that's what I believe for. It didn't happen that day in that particular instance, but that's what I believe for. But it did happen that day in a New Age bookstore because I'm never afraid because I know that in confrontation, in resistance, in challenge, it activates the anointing in me. I don't run from battles. I run to battles. This is what Emerge is all about. His bowed and eyes closed. For all I know, propaganda may have done it last night, but afford me this lecture. If you're here tonight, heads bowed and eyes closed. You're not right with God. Maybe right now you're not sure if you were to die where you'd go. My campus pastor that stood out that I told you about when I preached off a lunch bench at my university two nights ago, my mentor died suddenly. He's way too young to die. It's just a reminder, man. Death can come at any time. Sometimes when you're young, man, you think, oh, man, I got all my years. I'll get serious with God when I get older, when I get married, when I get... Hey, let me tell you what. The only assurance that God is in your future is that you got God in your present. Because some of you keep going down the road of compromise and sin. There's no guarantee you'll even desire God. And let me tell you what. Life is cruel to those that don't learn the early lessons. And the early lesson is this. When you have a tug of war, you get the strongest kid at the camp or in the street on your side pulling the rope or you're going to get drug on the ground. Let me tell you, the strongest one is Jesus. So when the devil comes pulling, you got Jesus pulling the rope on your side. And it's going to be the devil drug through the mud, not you. If you're here right now, you say, well, Sean, man, I don't know about church, man. I don't know about youth groups, man. There's some hypocrites. There's some people, man, they're not really living. Let me tell you what, maybe what bothers you should actually amaze you. What do you mean, Sean? I mean that God can take weak people and take and accept people right where they're at. They didn't have to clean up and get perfect and have everything right for God to begin to work on them and work with them. Maybe what bothers you should actually amaze you, that the fact that you see some weakness in people in a church, maybe that's a good sign that God can start right where you're at and he'll continue to do what he does. The Bible says he will begin a good work in you completed the day of Christ. If you're here right now, say, Sean, I'm not giving my life to Christ. I've walked away from the Lord. I need to walk back. Or quietly behind closed doors, I know the current activities of my life. I know God's not blessing it. I need to get right. If you're one way, a youth or young adults or your college meeting or church, and you're another way, it's cool what you do Sunday morning, but the question is, what were you doing Saturday night? What will you do Monday morning? Because this thing's 24-7. It's, it's not a belief system. Jesus died. That's religion. He died for you to have his life. He came that you may have life, life more. But if you're here right now, I say, Sean, pray with me. 
I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come back to the Lord. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, slip your hand up right now. Slip it up wherever you're at. Yes. Say, Sean, I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come back. I need to know that I know. If you already know, you die where you're going. You have a relationship. I'm not asking you, do you believe in Jesus? Now, now hear this. That if I leave that hanging, that sounds wrong. I'm not asking you, do you believe in Jesus? I'm asking you, does your belief in Jesus translate into victory over the devil and the peace that passes on understanding? Because if you're not getting victory, you're not having peace. You don't have faith in a biblical sense. You understand that there's a God out there, but you've never made the life connection. If you don't have victory over the devil and peace, get your hand up. If you don't know if you were to die, where you go, get your hand up. If you know that like the prodigal, you need to come back to Jesus now and come to Jesus moments are awesome, get your hand up right now. Can I get everybody? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I get, yes. Can I get everyone that's lifting your hand? You're not alone. I'd say at least eight folks, if not more, lifting their hands. Maybe nine, ten. Yes. Can I get everybody lifting? Eleven. Come on, awesome. Can I get everybody that's lifting their hand? Just, I mean, excuse me, that are lifting their hand. Stand up right where you are. Would you just do that? Stand up. Don't be shy. Don't, don't, don't let the devil think that he can embarrass you now from making a stance. Because if you give him the impression he could do it now, you'll never stand out there. These folks is with you. You can't stand here. This is training. This, you're starting to lift some weights. I'm standing right here, right now. I don't always do this, but I think it's so important because I feel the presence of God so strong. With those of you who are standing, would you come meet me right here? I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to take long. But I think it's important. Would you step right out from where you're at? I feel the love of God cascading. I feel like in my heart, every now I feel this, where it's like the Lord is going to overwhelm you with his love. In fact, break you with his love. You're just going to feel that love. Jesus, I just pray, God, over these that are standing, I just pray an overwhelming, overwhelming, undeniable presence of the love of God. I just declare over these, it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, people say, well, man, you don't know what I've done. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, dying on the cross, getting up out of the tomb, and what he's doing right now. He ever lives to make intercession for you. The Bible's clear. If we'll call on his name, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus comes. He does what he does. He's a redeemer. He's a restorer. He is redemptocentric. He's focused on redeeming and restoring. Let's pray right now. Would you pray with me right now? All of us together and would... Come on, fam. Y'all join with me. This is a community right here that we would join right now. 20 some odd folks that are standing right here. Let's all pray together. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Come on, everybody. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you as Lord of my life. I need you to say this like you mean it. Come on, fam. We're all praying with these up here. This is life-giving. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you as Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I turn to you. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, for loving me. And I declare tonight, I'm a child of God. I have victory over the enemy. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And I will serve you all my days, all my days, in Jesus' name. Those of you that are up here, just put your hand over your heart. You don't have to pray after me. I'm praying over you. Father, you love these. Just close your eyes. I just pray, God, right now, you would seal your love over every life up here. God, some of them, maybe it, their hand is over a heart that has had heartache. Maybe their hand is over a heart that's lost hope. Maybe their hand is over a heart that's been disappointed one too many times. But I thank you right now, this heart becomes a home to Jesus. And the Bible says you give a hope that does not disappoint so you knock out literally the things that weigh a heart down by showing up. And I just pray, God, I pray you would break off any, any, any hold that the enemy would have on any of their lives. I declare freedom. I declare peace. I declare joy unspeakable. I declare they're walking back at certain points to their seats like they're walking on 20 feet of air. They're above it, God. I thank you that your love literally takes away the venom, God, rejections of the past. The answer to all rejection is Christ's loving acceptance where he loves you. And I declare over them right now freedom, 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 man, freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Brandon, if you'd place your hand right here on this young man, man, the hand of the Lord is so on this gentleman right here. Father, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus, all of these are being marked by the presence and love of God. But I'm telling you what, man, 
I, I, I feel, young man, the Lord is extracting some stuff of the last season that the enemy has just tried to, kind of like we used to have these snake bite kits, and I don't know why, because in the city of Oakland, there wasn't no snakes, but we just had it as a toy, and you would cut yourself open a little bit more, and you had this suction cup thing, and it supposedly would suck out the venom. Uh, I don't know if it worked, <laughs> but I got one. I, I redeemed cans and stuff. Well, I'm telling you what, I just feel like the Lord is extracting any kind of the bite or venom of a last season, uh, just stuff that doesn't need to be there. And he's just, as he's doing it, he's purifying, purifying desires, purifying your dream, your, your heart, purifying, man, your value and what God's, and he, what he's doing over you, he's doing over all of us. So Lord, we just bless him. We bless him. He's marked. He's marked in a good way. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. You tell me, Marcos, is there, is there something, or, or should we just let him go back and sit down, or please? You guys, follow Brandon right now. Everybody turn this way. Y'all give them amazing. Come on, y'all turn. We'll watch his stuff, promise you. You're going to be right back with us. He's just going to pray with you, give you some stuff that can help you give you a moment. We wouldn't be right to rush back through this like this wasn't incredible. If I can get Brandon to come up here real quick. You guys sit down. We're going to flow and then we're going to open up the altars. I talked to Marcos and he said, hey bro, it's conference time so we can go over. So sometimes, you know, you go to youth group or you go to college career and you're in and out. We have a burger place called in and out <laughs> California. You're in and out quick. I get it. People got schedules. You got stuff. When you show up for a conference, how many of you know revivals break out when, when services go over time? Okay? I just want us to sing a song, just a chorus, uh, something worshipful. And then my son and I, we want to step out. We want to prophesy, call out things, pray for the sick. And then we're just going to, we're not going to go super long. So I know maybe your folks is out in the parking lot. Maybe some of y'all don't know how it works. But if I'm a mom or dad and my, my kid, at this time of night, on a Saturday night, he's in the house of God. I'll wait in a parking lot. I'll wait at a Starbucks. I'll wait at a DMV. Come on, somebody, man. I'm just, and I don't know about that. No, I'm kidding. I, I would be excited that my son or daughter is being impacted by God. So we just want to take a minute and invite. So even now, as a team is just going to sing this chord, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. Holy Spirit, manifest that which Christ purchased for us at Calvary. We thank you for your presence. We pray encounters. We pray and thank you that we have the mind of Christ. We thank you for the revelatory release of Holy Spirit. And we just declare, God, you love them. And we're, Brandon and I, all of us, we're locking into that stream of love. Follow the way of love, yet eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Hallelujah. We're just going to sing this chorus. Let your heart turn to the Lord. Just begin to love on Jesus. As we make him the object of our affections, this is where God begins to bring the inner renovations that lead to outward reformations. Inward revival begins in the left center cavity of your chest, your heart. No, I won't be ashamed any longer With you by my side I stand taller My sin was erased Now my life says I am free I am free no, I won't be ashamed any longer With you by my side I stand taller My sin was erased Now my life proclaims I am free I am free No, I won't be ashamed any longer With you by my side
Jesus, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit. You're here. Your presence, God, and when your presence is here, we know your power is here. Lord, you love us, and we can bank on that. We thank you, Jesus, that, Lord, this is one of those set-apart moments. You're giving us that a beginning of Acts 13 because we're going to walk out these doors at the end of Acts 13 and, God, see people get saved and ignited and walk in authority. Would You, you can go ahead and be seated real quickly. First of all, I'm just kind of dialoguing real quick with Holy Spirit and dialoguing with my son. We're, kinda, we're gonna start with some words of knowledge. I feel like uh, there are some healings that are going on, and I feel like three specific things the Lord gave me, and I feel like it's almost like a boom, boom, boom. Sometimes I'll get this succession sweep. And I feel like, number one, there's a, a female that uh, you have multiple uh, allergies, and they're kind of extreme. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's not just, okay, certain time of year, I sneeze a little bit. There's multiple food allergies. There's environmental allergies. Uh, and even some that affect your skin in some other areas. And, and I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, oh man, there's, a, there's a, I don't know why I'm just blanking. But uh, celiac, I'm not sure if it's diagnosed as celiac disease. It's kind of a hyperallergenic. But there's a girl that has that. Number two, there's also a girl, and I saw a quick picture, that you have a, a issue with your back and it seems like there's a slight protrusion I'm not sure if you have scoliosis or there's something that's happening in your back but I feel like it's keeping you from something I don't know if you do dance you do gym gymnastics or you do something cheer or something but uh, this is particularly difficult for you because of uh, a heart and a thing that you have and then I feel like there's another gentleman right over here I feel like as you're going this way that you have a knee thing but it's almost like inside your knee. So I don't know if it's a ligament thing or uh, it's kind of like uh, this issue is behind your knee. So it's not an, a topical, you know, you, am I making sense? It's not like you, you hit your knee against the wall and you got like a thing. It's, it seems like it's an internal ligament thing or structural thing on the inside of your knee. And Sean, what is this? First Corinthians chapter 12 uh, talks about nine gifts of spirit. One of them is a word of knowledge where God reveals, but God isn't like Maury Povich. <laughs> Maury reveals it to exploit it. God reveals it to heal it. And so he's saying this because he's on this. He's doing that. So who do those words apply to? Stand up if that's you right now. Stand up wherever you're at if that's you. One right there. Okay. Who is the others? Uh, you'll have to help me out. Okay, good. Oh, someone behind me? Amen. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Who's our guy that has a knee? Uh, you've got this knee thing, and it seems like I don't know if your knee gets stuck or something, but you have some sort of tendon ligament thing with your knee. Sir, where are you at? Uh, the Lord doesn't want to heal you. Right over there. I felt like you were over there. Okay. Can people go to these three right now real quickly, real quickly, real quickly? Okay. Go to them. Put a hand on them real quick. I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to hand it right off to Brandon. We're going to pray for you. And here, here's what I'm saying. When God gives me words of knowledge, if I can make it in a layman's crass term, it is catapults my faith to feel like your healing's already done. Like, so this is not like, man, I'm wishing. When the Lord gives me a word, Psalms 107, he sent forth his word to heal. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord, word of God. I feel like there's a strong. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak to the uh, autoimmune system of this gal. We just declare in the name of Jesus that Lord, her system would not be falsely threatened by allergens, by foods, by chemicals, Lord, there would not be this suffering in this pattern. We break off this thing that maybe even some of it, doctors may even say, hey, it, it, it's you're genetically predisposed. It's almost like I, I could hear a doctor kind of giving you a, a, a statement on that, a byline. We just declare, Lord, in the name of Jesus, this is not your perfect will. Father, we declare, bless the Lord, oh my soul. We'll forget none of his benefits. He pardoned all our iniquities, heal all our diseases. We pray for the girl's back. We command the back and the spine to be straightened. We cast scoliosis, if it's in fact scoliosis or the protrusion. We command alignment to come to the spine as if the Lord grabs the top of the spine, the bottom of the spine. He is the ultimate chiropractor, pulls, straightens it out. And we declare you're back to doing the things you love to do without the pain associated with it. If it's jogging, if it's running, if it's dance, if it's whatever, jumping. Lord, we declare no pain, no problem. These signs follow them that believe. And we pray for our brother's knee, ligament, structure, or otherwise. We say 
the injury leaves, healing comes. And we thank you, God, that you took up their infirmities, you bore their sickness. By Jesus' stripes, they're made whole. They're made whole. They're made whole. We're going to leave you in that just for a moment, and I'm going to let Brandon step out. But those of you that are praying, listen, because he, his word can apply to you. And then in a moment, we're going to test for miracles. We're going to ask people to do and step and activate. Go ahead, Brandon. Oh, man. Brandon wrote on his phone. He had the autoimmune, so that's, yeah. that's right And on. the skin rash. All right, there's a couple of things. I write them down so I don't forget them. Um, I, I believe you're a male. You have a really bad right shoulder. It's like a strained right shoulder. Um, and I saw the Lord bringing healing to that. Second thing I wrote down was there's a girl here. You have constantly really bad migraines. And not even sure if you know this, but it has to do with a slipped disc in your neck. And I, I saw the Lord bring an alignment to your vertebrae and those discs in your neck. Um, two other things. One, I saw a woman, you have really trouble, like trouble breathing. There's a respiratory problem in your, in your system. And it's almost like this pressure that collapses on your chest, especially at nighttime. You, it's, you're not snoring, but you're breathing extremely heavy. And I saw the Lord opening that up. Um, where are those three people? Strained right shoulder. You could be a female. If it applies to you and you're having trouble in that right shoulder, where are you? I want to pray for you. Let's see. It's you right here? Awesome. Um, who's the girl? You have really bad migraines. It has to do with a disc in your neck and your vertebrae being out of alignment. Who's that female here? You have those terrible migraines. I almost feel like you can't do anything else, takes the energy out of you. Who's that? I want to pray for you. It's you? Okay. And then last, not least, the respiratory issue, the breathing. Um, I want to say you're in this area right here. I'm kind of stepping out in faith. Um, you have really trouble breathing. Your respiratory system is not operating to the fullest right now, and you feel that pressure, and it's like this pressure on your chest. Going once, going twice. All right. If you could put a hand on her shoulder right now. We're going to pray for her. And then, sir, could you put your hand on his right shoulder over here? We're just going to believe that Jesus heals. <laughs> Lord, I just, I thank you already that you're here. Father, and I thank you that these hands are being laid on these two. We just declare that these are your extended hands of Jesus. And the healing anointing that rested on Jesus are in these hands. And so we speak healing to your bodies. We command everything to come into alignment in Jesus' name. And we speak to your bodies and your spirits. And we just say, on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, we speak to the shoulder. We say, pain, you got to go. Stiffness, you got to go. Strength, mobility, you come back. And, Father, I pray for every vertebrae and every disc in my sister's neck. I command you right now to come into alignment. We say migraines be gone. Father, I thank you that pain has to bow down before King Jesus. You took up our infirmities, Jesus. You bore our sicknesses. By your stripes, we are made whole. And so we speak wholeness. We speak healing. We speak life over these bodies. And even right now, you can feel that just that peace that's coming over your body. And that's the healing touch of Jesus. Last thing, I saw... Um, I saw a young person, and again, this one's a little bit more sensitive, um, so I'm probably going to have you guys at least bow your heads for this one, uh, but I saw this just uh, this unusual demonic activity. I, I saw this dark figure over your shoulder, and what I saw was this voice that's been feeding you lies, and even at night, you find it really hard to sleep because you feel like you're not alone in your room, even though you are alone. And you wake up in the middle of the night and you have these night terrors and you can feel this evil demonic presence that, that stays with you. And it feels like your only relief is whenever you come here to church. We want to make sure that thing doesn't follow you home tonight. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand and I'm just going to pray over you. We're just going to break that power of that demonic thing that it has in your life. If that's you, raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's several of you. <laughs> I'm going to pray over you. Jesus, I thank you for your children. I thank you for your peace. 
And Father, right now, we just take authority over any other voice, God, any demonic thing that would try and come and try and ruin their peace, that would try and feed them lies, that would try and bring confusion, that would try and bring, God, darkness or this dark cloud. Father, I just pray that you would silence every other voice right now. Father, that the voice that they would hear right now is that one of peace, that one of love, that one is secure, that you are safe. And Father, I just pray right now for just even a hedge of protection over them, that you would surround them right now with just even a, um, God, a pillar of fire. Father, that would protect them from every voice of the enemy that would try and come into their life. And I just declare tonight that when you go home, you no longer have to walk in fear. And when you sleep tonight, it will be sweet. Then instead of feeling fear and feeling afraid in your room at nighttime, you're going to feel loved. <laughs> you're going to feel the peace of God. And I just pray, even right now, I pray that the presence of God would go before them already in their tomorrow. Father, already in their tonight. Father, when they sleep, that the presence of God would just surround them. Father, we break off the attack of the enemy now. We say you got to go. <laughs> God, these are your children. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Hmm. Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blood deficiency. There's a woman right here in this section. Uh, there's some sort of blood deficiency. I'm not sure if it's blood sugar. I'm not sure if it's iron in your blood. Do you have something right there in the red? Yes. You know, it's funny. You were the one that jumped out. Would you stand up? I just feel like the Lord's doing a healing in the blood in your body. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just declare over our sister a healing for her blood. How ironic that it's the blood of Jesus that brings healing to her blood. We just declare, God, right now, it's like sometimes you go to doctors, they'll hook you up to a machine or something that your blood goes through something that comes back in your body, and it's like, better blood or whatever. Lord, we declare that the transfusion of the cross is bringing healing to her blood. And we declare the iron level in her blood, the sugar levels in her blood, everything. We just declare your energy has been compromised in the past. You find yourself depleted and weary. Sometimes you can find yourself as tired at two o'clock in the day as you used to be at 10 o'clock in the day. And I just declare that is over that literally the energy of the Lord, there's even a Greek word, energios, the energios of the Lord, the same spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is now alive in you and quickens and quickens and quickens and quickens your mortal body in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. My sister, right here in the blue, you have a step out, step in shirt. Yep, 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 yep. Would you stand up? What's your name? Elizabeth? Oh, that's awesome. I love that. I love it. That's a straight biblical right there. Lift your hands up, Elizabeth. Uh, several things I, I, I felt like, and, and kind of moving from words of knowledge to, to uh, prophecy. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, I just felt like the Lord says, you know, we, we, we use the term, that person is a magnet, and we'll use fill in the blank, like blank magnet, like whatever. They're this magnet, that magnet. I felt like the Lord says, in this season, my sister Elizabeth is becoming a favor magnet. The favor of the Lord is being drawn to you. And I saw this picture and I know exactly what it is, right? There's this story in the Bible where David, the, the ark had gotten away uh, from the children of God. And it was at this guy named Obed Edom's house. And the ark parked in front of his house. And it says his house was blessed. That literally the ark. And I just, I'm supposed to tell you that the ark is parked at your house. That there is not only favor on you, but there is a series of breakthroughs that are going to come to your family. And I just see some loved ones. I just see some serious, I feel like some of them you've been in intercession and praying for and really laying it before the Lord. Because some of them, it's kind of like, it's a crossroads moment for them that there needs to be this breakthrough revelation encounter with Jesus, man, where God does what only God can do. And I feel like they're, the healers come into your house, the restorers come into your house, the deliverers come into your house. And your prayers have been heard. You, let me, let me just tell you, ask audaciously. Is that a word? Ask, man, outrageously. You have got God's attention. You have an abiding place. 
and there's a fire of revival. The embers of revival is in your heart, Elizabeth. But I'm here to tell you, you're, you're pregnant with the prophetic, very much like your namesake, Elizabeth, was pregnant with John the Baptist. You're pregnant with the prophetic, and there's prophetic intercession that's about to be birthed through you. I feel like there's this a ministry of prophetic intercession, and, and man, this fire that comes out of your belly, so to speak, that's going to bless a lot, a lot, a lot of people. The Lord has marked you in this season. And people that knew you, Elizabeth, five years ago, if they've been out of your life five years, are going to see you within the next five months. And they're not even going to recognize you because God has put his glory on you that the ark has been at Obed-Edom's house. And the Lord says, you and your household are blessed. So we just declare what the enemy has slated, what he's scheduled, what he's attacked, what he's gotten his hands on, what he's ripped off, what he's tried to steal, what he's tried to delay, what he's tried to deny. We break it. We say no. We say not today, Satan. And we declare blessing upon blessing. And we thank you that, God, we don't have to worry about curses when we're blessed because the curse is, a, is the absence of a blessing. When a blessing's in place, it cannot be cursed. Lord, we we find that out in Proverbs. We find that out with Balaam and Balak. So we declare blessing, 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 blessing in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Does that mean something to you? Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to step out and just like Brandon, okay, baseball talk. Manager, the, the leadoff hitter is a leadoff hitter because they have the highest percentage of getting on base. So when I say when you move prophetically, you go with what comes strongest and what came first, because that has, so as I continually go, I'm stretching further and further out, okay? Further and further and further out, further and further and further out, okay? I got digits, and sometimes I'll get digits, and it's, you know, like they say, please give me the last four of your social, or however that works, because one time, I, I'm not exaggerating, I got a full social security number, and I called it on a person responded, and they were a little sheepish about it and understood because not everybody's sanctified in our midst. There might be some identity theft folk in the room. So God is four digit, but it can also be a date. So I got 4204, 4204. And I've got a word for that person. Who does that apply to? What does that mean to you? That's your last four of your souls. Hallelujah. Lift your hands up. Come on. What's your name? I'm sorry. Melanie. Awesome. Melanie. Lift your hands up. Mm, mm. Melody, in this season, the Lord is identifying a distinction of something that he's put on your life. I see Melanie like a little girl that comes up at Christmas and goes to the Christmas tree thinking she's opened up all the gifts. And all of a sudden, Daddy comes downstairs and says, Sweetheart, no, I know you're playing with all these things you're open, but the biggest box is still on the other side of the tree. For some reason, it got wrapped, it got hidden under wrapping paper. You didn't see it. And all of a sudden, the little girl's super surprised. I feel like you recognize that there are certain giftings you have, but the Lord says this is a season as, as a season of distinction in the same way that he prophetically as a sign calls out the last four of your soch that he is identifying you in this season as a woman of distinction and saying that there is another gift to be unwrapped. And I feel like this gift is something that will bless the body, but I also feel like this gift, uh, I'm just going to say it, can also in a sense be a means of income and, and, and again, you know, we, we have conventional, traditional ways in which we think of how that can work. And I feel like the creativity of the Lord, Holy Ghost, is off the chart. Let's begin with that. But I feel like the Lord is uh, causing a gifting to emerge. And there's an intersection between the biggest box under the tree and a dream in your heart. And I feel like God is going to use this in a way that it will bless kingdom, but it will bless you. And it will be, I believe, a, a source for you. A, a source, a, a resource for you. I'm going to be specific. And I really feel, Melanie, in this season, the Lord wants you to know you're not forgotten. Not that you would go around and ever say that. But the Lord wants you to know he is not forgotten. He is not forgotten. He's not overlooked. It's not been like, you know, sometimes you can just go through a season where it's like, God, I know you love me. I know, you know, whatever. You, you take care of me. But Lord, and I just feel like the Lord 
said, I only got one number, and it's your number tonight of a social security number that God is saying, do not forget this night, my daughter, because this is now a season of distinction. This is a season where the Lord is marking you and putting his hand on your life in a new way. And, and here's a phrase that's kind of biblical term. You're being seasoned with new salt. Bible talks about sacrifices being seasoned with salt. We know of the New Testament, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. But in the Old Testament, a sacrifice couldn't be laid on the altar before the Lord in the times of the patriarchs unless it was seasoned with salt. And the Lord says, you're his sacrifice. He is seasoning you with new salt. And whenever there's a sacrifice, on the other end of a sacrifice comes a release from heaven. And you're in this season where God is releasing a dream for you. So, Lord, we just bless Melanie. We thank you that, Lord, there's something so mighty on her life. Oh, my God. Everybody stretch your hands towards her. Close your eyes, Melanie. On three, I just want you to take a deep breath. I just feel the presence of God on you strong. On three, take a deep breath. And on three, we're just going to say, touch her, Lord. One, two, three. Touch her, Lord, right there. Just breathe in right there in the name of Jesus. Touch, touch, touch. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Brandon? Yeah, there was a guy who was sitting somewhere around here. You were in a pink hat earlier. Um, it was pink or it was like a really bright hat. Is he here? He's in the back? Okay. We'll go to the next one. Um, is Crystal here? Crystal. If it's not your actual name, it's somebody extremely close to you. The name Crystal is very significant for you. Where is that? Crystal. Kept hearing the name Crystal. So, is that you? Your daughter's name's Crystal. Okay, that would apply. Yeah, that's extremely close to you. Your only one. Okay, extremely close. All right, this is what I wrote down. I wrote this down earlier in worship. Um, the Lord, he wanted me to tell you that what the enemy made bitter, he was going to make sweet again. And I was reminded of the story um, where Elisha, uh, it's the pot of stew that was poison that they also known it was like the pot that had death. And uh, he put some flour in it and it was good again. And I just felt like, man, there's been, there's been some things that have, um, like all of us, but for you, this is very specific. Um, there's some things that have really had a lasting bitter taste in your mouth. Um, things went sour really quick. And I felt like what the Lord wanted to tell you was that he was going to make it sweet again. He was going to make it sweet like honey. And it was just going to be this amazing story of our redemptive God, the God who reconciles all things back into himself. And so I just want to pray that over you. Lord, I just thank you for my sister right now. And I just thank you that what that thing that might have tasted like death, that thing that was once bitter, that you're making sweet again. It's going to be sweet like honey. The Father, there's going to be so many who are going to be blessed because of the work, the redemptive work that you were doing in her life. I thank you that, man, you called her out tonight. God, you got her number. And so, Lord, I just bless you. And I just, I'm, I'm so excited to hear that thing become sweet again. It's going to become so sweet. It is going to be a sweet life for you, ma'am. We bless you. Amen. Um, is there a Darren or a Darius? I, I, I couldn't decipher between the two. Darren, Darius, it's you're, the first part of your name is Dur. <laughs> Dur. Is Dur here? <laughs> Dur. Darren, Darius. Man, it's, again, if it's not your actual name, it's somebody who's really close to you. Again, even though I'm up here on the mic, I'm still like, I still just try and step out in faith. You know, that's the amazing thing of like, even if I don't get it, it doesn't really matter. I, I don't really, I'm not scared of like coming up here and failing and swinging and striking out. It's because on the other side, sometimes of us stepping out in faith is the miracles that happen in people's lives, right? And again, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm sure there's some of you who are kind of like, man, this guy, he's like, He's playing the guessing game. You know what? No, I'm just stepping out in faith. And, you know, like, I could really care less about my reputation. Like, my reputation was nailed with Jesus at the cross. It's about him, right? So, 
Darius, Darian, Darren. You're here somewhere, man. That name, oh, is that you on the camera? Okay, I couldn't see you, man. All right. This is what I wrote down. <laughs> I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord in his throne room, and he picked up this phone that had your name on it. And this is what I just felt like. I feel like the, the Lord is calling you, man. Like, I think there's this, uh, there's a couple things. One, to remind you that you have a great calling on your life. Like, it's kind of crazy that you're behind the scenes right now, but the Lord, he would decide to call that out for you. And right now is your season, man. This is your moment. I feel like the Lord is going to bring you into one of those seasons where it just kind of feels like what people would say is like, my stars are aligned. The stars are aligned for you this season, man. I just feel like the Lord has put some stuff in place for you. He's gone ahead of you, and he's breaking some things open. I forgot that one passage in the Bible, but it's talking about how he's the God of breakthrough, that he's the breaker. He's the one who goes before us. And I feel like the Lord is already in your next season, and he's called you, and it's going to be one of the most um, fulfilling seasons of your life that you're about to step into. Um, and it's just a reminder of the big calling that he has placed on your life. And I even feel like there's some like unfulfilled things of your ancestors, like parents and grandparents and the callings that they have had on their life that have been yet to be fulfilled. And I feel like the Lord is just like, it's been this momentum thing that's coming down on you, man. And um, you're going to begin to pick up some of those things that they left unfinished. And... Um, yeah, I just pray for you. I just thank you that your stars are aligned, that God is already in your next season, and he says it's good. And he's gone before you, and he's breaking things open, and he's putting things where they need to be. So when you get there, it's going to be really good, man. Bless you. Marcos, you get ready. I know we've gone over time. How many of you, it's okay tonight we went over time? Okay. Here's what I want to do, and I'd be remiss. Oh, right here? Yeah, bro? Oh, pink hat. Come on. Hey, man, we thought we lost you. <laughs> What's your name? Brian? Cool. Lord, I just, I thank you for Brian. I just thank you for the calling on your life, man. And um, it's like one of those things, man, I felt like the Lord was just like, I want to remind him how special his different is. It's like you're wired different. Like in the sense that there's this like specialness that you have. Um, and that's your superpower, man. You're different. And it's going to enable you to make a great difference. And so, Father, I just thank you for Brian. I just thank you for how you've made him. God, he was, he was, I thank you that you were so intentional. God, in his wiring and his personality and all the gifts, you're a, you're a gifted guy. Like, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me if you're one of those dudes that you just pick something up and you're really good at it automatically. And everyone else is like, man, why are you so good at this, Brian? And you're like, man, I don't know. It's just me. <laughs> People are laughing because I, I think it's probably true. But I, you're, a gifted, you're a gifted individual, man. And you have a humongous calling ahead of you. And the Lord has already been preparing you for this, for what you're going to step into. Whether you realize it or not, he's put everything inside of you that you're going to need on the journey. And so, Lord, I just bless him on his journey. I just thank you, man, that you, uh, you're a special dude like in the, in the best way. And I felt like tonight, when I saw you in that pink cat, I just felt like the Lord said, I'm highlighting him. I'm highlighting him. You've been highlighted, man. You've been highlighted by the Lord. And so, Lord, we just, God, we bless him. And Father, anything that I have that can be imparted into Brian, Father, I just impart that into him now. We just say an impartation, God, of the favor that's on my life, God, an impartation, Father, of the anointing that I carry, Father, even an impartation of the fire. Man, and the Lord is, he's going to bring you places that he can't bring everybody. Just because of how you are. That you're going to be in places where you're going to just be like, man, I don't know how I got here, <laughs> but I am here. And you're going to be with people that you're like, I don't know why I'm with these people, but you're there. And so, Lord, I just bless Brian. God, I bless him on his journey in Jesus' name. Brian, I just add to that, in your past season, you would say the struggle is real. You know the phrase, the struggle is real. You're about to head into a season where people that see you are going to say the strength is real. 
God's going to turn the struggle into strength for you. And your influence on people's lives in this next season is going to be amazing. God's about to magnify. He's going to really do that thing. Awesome. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have the worship team worship. But if you're out there and you're saying, I want God to supernaturally mark my life. I want a fresh anointing. Uh, it's biblical. The Bible uh, lets us know David was anointed. But there's even a phrase that says, the Lord has anointed me with fresh oil. He's exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. What that speaks of is an increase of anointing. You have the anointing on your life, but a uh, horn like that of a wild ox. Uh, there's many ways of looking at it, but I believe that God wants to raise your voice to make it a voice of awakening. When they blew that ox horn, ram's horn, or whatever, it was a signal to battle. So if you're saying that's what I want, I want a fresh anointing for the supernatural. I want a fresh anointing to influence folks out there. Get out of your seat and come up front right now. If that's what you're saying right now, as you're coming, I, wherever Jordan is at, if your name is Jordan, the Lord says this is a threshold moment for you. Much like the nation of Israel crossing the Jordan. And then to TJ, there's someone your initials are TJ. If, uh, TJ, is that you, sir? This totally makes sense because you'll get this. And I thought of some young person, it'll slip them. There was a detective series called TJ Hooker. The Lord says, I'm about to hook TJ up. That doors of opportunity that have felt closed are about to open now before you. God says, I'm a God that open doors. No man can shut, shut doors. No one can open. Worship team, turn it up. Come on, let's just get loose. Let's worship him. Jesus.